All right, everybody, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome back to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens, and this is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. And tonight, we're going to look at Sutta number 50 in the Majjhima Nikaya, so in the Middle Length Discourses. Um, and kind of a quick word about that. So if you've been coming to Dharma Doors for a while, you know that we've been making our way through this. We haven't been reading every sutta, but we've been reading most of them. And as you know, this is one of the multiple collections of suttas that are from the early Buddhist tradition. And this particular one, the Majjhima Nikaya, the, the middle length teachings of the Buddha, this collection has 150, actually 152 suttas, and it's divided into three parts with basically 50 suttas in each. And since we are at sutta number 50, it means we are at the very end of the first part of this collection. So I just wanted to note that. The, the last little section that we've been looking at is um, a bunch of suttas that are, they are given in pairs. So they are given kind of together. And so this sutta kind of goes along with last week's sutta. And the connection between the two is going to be this character or this figure, Mara. And in fact, the, the, the name of this sutta tonight is the Mara Tachjaniya Sutta, the, the rebuke of Mara. So, um, yeah, actually, even before we kind of dive into this, I want to just mention something quickly. Um, I, I kind of said this last week, but I just want to remind you that, you know, because we're going to be dealing with Mara, you know, this is sort of the the Buddhist equivalent of the, the devil in that way, right? But I want to kind of really remind you of what I said last week, which is that these are stories. And the Buddhists, they know that these are stories. <laughs> All right. So I want to kind of make that really clear. But tonight is going to be a weird story. I haven't myself, I haven't really fully figured this sutta out. I've There's many layers to it. So this evening, I think we're going to have a lot of fun kind of going through this and kind of trying to figure out what exactly is going on with this one. This is going to be another of those suttas, though, where it's not about the Buddha. This is one of those suttas where it's actually about Magalyayana or the Maha Mogalana. Um, and I want to kind of give you just a quick reminder that in the Buddhist tradition, like in the old school, actually in all Buddhist traditions, doesn't matter what kind, the Buddha, the historical Buddha, had two primary disciples. Shariputra the Wise and Maha Madhulyayana, who's the star of tonight. And it this is all relevant, by the way, to what is going to happen in the sutta. But basically, the idea is that the Buddha has this one senior disciple, Shariputra, who is sort of known for being like you know, I, I think I've called him the Dharma nerd, right? So he's like really intellectual about the Dharma and knows all of like the teachings in that way. Whereas Magalana or Mad, Madgulyayana in Sanskrit is known for being like master meditator. So the master of the passive dhyana, samadhi, like that whole world. So this kind of 
polarity or these kind of ideas of the dharma and the practice of meditation we're just going to want to pay attention to those a little bit later on but tonight we're going to learn about mogalyana and something interesting that happened to him <laughs> so let's dive in um i think we're going to take this one pretty slowly like just kind of paragraph by paragraph because it has like multiple um, sections or movements so the mara tajjaniya sutta the rebuke of mara thus have i heard on one occasion the venerable maha magalyana was living in the bahaga country at sum sumara sum Sumaragira in the Behesakala Grove, the Deer Park, a new location for us. Now, on that occasion, the Venerable Maha Mogalyana was walking up and down in the open. And on that occasion, Mara, the evil one, went into the venerable Mahamagulyana's belly and entered his bowels. Then the venerable Mahamagulyana considered thus, Why is my belly so heavy? One would think I'm full of beans. <laughs> thus he left the walk and went into his dwelling where he sat down on a seat made ready. When he had sat down, he gave thorough attention to himself. And he saw that Mara the evil one had gone into his belly and had entered his bowels. When he saw this, he said, Come out, evil one! Come out, evil one! Do not harass the Tathagata, do not harass the Tathagata's disciple, or it will lead to your harm and suffering for a long time. Then Mara the evil one thought, This recluse doesn't know me. He doesn't see me when he says that. Even his teacher would not know me so soon. So how can this disciple know me? Then the Venerable Mahamagulyana said, Even thus, I know you, evil one. Don't think he doesn't know me. You're Mara, the evil one. You were just thinking now. Evil one, this recluse doesn't know me. He doesn't see me when he says that. Even his teacher would not know me so soon, so how can this, this disciple know me? Then Mara the evil one thought, The recluse knew me. He saw me when he said that. Whereupon Mara came up from the venerable Mahamogalyana's mouth and stood against the door bar. <laughs> the venerable Mahamogalyana saw him standing there and said, I see you there too, evil one. Don't think he doesn't see me. You're standing against the door bar, evil one. All right, let's pause there. <laughs> so, something curious is going on here with Mara, the evil one, entering Maguliana's belly into his bowels and then having this kind of exchange with him. Now, the first thing I kind of want to remind you of from last week, we have um, we have the recurrence of this kind of language that we heard last week. So if you remember, last week, a god, a, a Brahma god, invited the Buddha up to heaven. And then when the Buddha was up in heaven, Mara possessed one of the Brahma, a, a different Brahma god, 
and basically was trying to tell the Buddha, you should bow down to this Brahma God as if they are the ultimate God. And the Buddha said, I see you, Mara. And it's this, so this is the recurring language here. It's this idea of, I see you, Mara. And I kind of want to let you know that this is sort of, you know, this is a part of the, it's a part of the practice in a way, which is to identify Mara and to point Mara out and say, I see you, Mara. I see what you're doing. And in other words, kind of what I want to get around to is, you know, I'm I'm open to reading this sutta sort of supernaturally, if you will. Like, I'm fine with that. I don't have objections to that. But I also think there's a way in which this is being kind of very poetic. And the idea here is, is that, well, we're not exactly sure what's going on with Mughalyana right now. Like what's up with his belly and Mara being in his belly. But in terms of like, well, let me put it to you this way. And I kind of meant to say this at the beginning. I want to kind of like, uh, um, I want to acknowledge that within the world of Buddhism, Mara is presented as this, um, yeah, you know, sometimes as like a trickster demon or something like that. But the general idea is that basically, and, and this is just me, this is just me putting it this way right now, but it's kind of like there's this idea that we have a little Mara on one shoulder <laughs> and we have a little Buddha on the other shoulder. <laughs> and it might be that we are about to engage in some habitual activity that we know is no good for us. And in fact, we don't even really want to do it. But there's this temptation. And maybe there's a little like, oh, go ahead, just do it. What does it matter? Nobody's looking, whatever. <laughs> but then there's another voice that's saying, you can do it this time. You don't need to give in to these desires. You can be liberated. You can be free. And that's the voice of the Buddha saying, that's your most enlightened aspect of yourself, saying you can do it. And there's the Mara saying, ah, whatever. And the idea is, is that you could, in a way, hear that little voice saying, yeah, just go ahead and do it. And you could have this kind of reaction, which is, I see you, Mara. I see what you're trying to do here. <laughs> you're not going to get the best of me. So even before we kind of know what's wrong with Mughalyana, I just want us to acknowledge that that's sort of one way of thinking about that idea of I see you, Mara. By the way, I, this just dawned on me too. There's a, I can't, I can't remember what sutta this is. It's one of the older suttas. And it's basically where the, the, the disciples go up to the Buddha and there's a question about, and again, I can't remember exactly how this is phrased, but it's basically about destroying Mara. And the disciples are like, Buddha, how did you destroy Mara? And the Buddha basically says, I didn't destroy Mara. I see Mara everywhere. But he doesn't get to me. And that's a really kind of an interesting approach to this idea where the Buddha says, oh, yeah, I see Mara all over the place. But the point is, is that the Buddha sees Mara. It's when we don't see Mara. And we are then kind of under Mara's sway. Or as we're going to hear in a moment, we might even be possessed by Mara in that sense. So, all right. So we don't still, we still don't know what's up with Mughalyana, but Mughalyana has called out Mara and said, I see you in there. And then Mara flies out through his mouth 
and basically kind of blocks the door in that way, right? He's up against the door bolt or the door bar. But then Mogliana tells Mara something very interesting. And what he says is, and this is where Mogliana is about to recall a past life. But it's very interesting because he says, and he's speaking to Mara. It happened once, evil one, that I was a Mara named Dusi, which means the corrupted. And I had a sister named Kali. You were her son, so you were my nephew. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, let me acknowledge that really quickly, by the way. So there's like a, a, a like a colloquialism in English these days. And the colloquialism is basically like they they call it sunning. And what what it is is it's it's the the position where you call somebody son. Like, look here, son. Let me tell you a thing or two about life. So that's a, the verb is sunning somebody, right? Well, basically, Mogliana is sunning Mara. <laughs> He's saying, yeah, guess what? You used to be my little nephew. And I was a wicked Mara. So let me give you, I'll give you the little backstory, but I do want to tell you a little bit about this idea of Mogoyana being Mara. But let's hear a little bit about the backstory. He says, now, on that occasion, the Buddha, the Blessed One, Kakusandaha, accomplished and fully enlightened, had appeared in the world. The Blessed One, Kakusanda, accomplished and fully enlightened, had an auspicious pair of chief disciples named Vidura and Sanjiva. Among all the disciples of the Blessed One, Kakusandha, accomplished and fully enlightened, there was none equal to the Venerable Vidura in teaching the Dharma. That was how the Venerable Vidura came to have that name, Vidurha, which means unrivaled. But the venerable Sanjiva, gone to the forest or to the root of the tree or an empty hut, entered without difficulty upon the cessation of perception and feeling. All right. Just because you, you may not know all of this, and I want to just fill you in real quickly. So... It's a very kind of well-established part of the Buddhist tradition, not the Mahayana, but all of Buddhism, but definitely the earlier tradition. There's an understanding, of course, that the world, the universe, is going through these very long periods of time that are called kalpas, a kalpa. And during this long expanse of time, the world can be created and destroyed and created and destroyed and created and destroyed over and over and over again. And the idea is, is that there is a kalpa, a period of time that we are in, and we've been in it for a while, actually we we are in this kalpa now and by the way it's called the bahadra kalpa the auspicious kalpa and it's during this kalpa that's happening right now it's during this kalpa that shakyamuni buddha was in the world you know 2500 years ago but a long time before that there was a Buddha before that, and a Buddha before that, and a Buddha before that. And in fact, there was, or Shakyamuni Siddhartha Gautama was the fourth 
Buddha of the Bhadrakalpa. And the very first Buddha of this Kalpa that we're in is Kakusandha, the, the Buddha that just got referenced here. By the way, the Bhadrakalpa has one more Buddha to go, and that's Maitreya, who will come a long time from now. And those are the five Buddhas of the Bhadrakalpa. So the first thing that's happening is that Mogulyana is telling us a, a backstory, a previous life story that took place when the first Buddha of this Kalpa appeared. So this is sort of like lifetimes and lifetimes and lifetimes and lifetimes and lifetimes ago. And what we're going to notice, oh, and we're going to want to remember that Mogulyana is a Mara called Dusi. But what's happening here is a kind of, um, maybe you could call it mirroring or something, but we have the Buddha Kakusandha with these two chief disciples, uh, Vidurha and Sanjiva. Notice that they are called chief in Dharma, chief in meditation, just like Shariputra and Magulyayana. So there's, again, there's parallels or mirroring going on here in our story. So, yeah, so now we're going to get the backstory or an interesting backstory on these two chief disciples of this Buddha. By the way, before we even go any further on this, I would like you all to know that What's happening here in this sutra now, this is, or it could be called, a trope of Buddhist sutras. And what I mean by a trope is that this kind of uh, past life recollection in allegorical form, it's, it's something you find a lot in Buddhist suttas. And it's a particular kind of trope that becomes almost like the foundation of a lot of Mahayana sutras, where they are a whole sutra that is entirely about back uh, past life stories. So it's a way of storytelling. And I would further want to kind of reinforce the idea that this is a story. And this isn't exactly about a historical person, Magulyayana, recalling a past life of his. I personally would not read this literally like that. I would read it allegorically, but again, I leave that up to you. But let's hear about what happens. Oh, one more thing. These types of stories are actually a very interesting meditative exercise because you actually are being asked to kind of hold and remember a lot of information. And so it almost becomes like difficult to remember, like, wait, where exactly are we? When are we? So let's remember Magulyana and Mara are, they're in his room and he's telling Mara, Back when there was the first Buddha, I was a Mara named Drusi, and so on and so forth. And now, paragraph 10, section 10. It happened once, evil one, that the venerable Sanjiva had seated himself at the root of a certain tree and entered that deepest of deep meditations, the cessation of perception and feeling. Now, some cow herders, sheep herders, plowmen and travelers saw the venerable Sanjiva sitting at the root of the tree, having entered upon the cessation of perception and feeling. And they thought, it is wonderful, sirs. It's marvelous. This recluse died while meditating. <laughs> or died while sitting. Let's cremate him. 
Then the cowherders, sheep herders, plowmen, and travelers collected grass, wood, and cow dung, and having piled it up against the venerable Sanjiva's body, they set fire to it, and they went on their way. Now, evil one, when the night had ended, the venerable Sanjiva emerged from the samapati, from the attainment of the cessation of perception and feeling. He shook his robe, and then, it being morning, he dressed, and taking his bowl and outer robe, he went into the village for alms. The cowherders, sheep herders, plowmen, and travelers saw the venerable Sanjiva wandering for alms, and they thought, it's wonderful, sirs, it's marvelous. The, the recluse who died while sitting has come back to life. That was how the venerable Sanjiva came to have the name Sanjiva, which means the survivor. <laughs> then, evil one, the Mara Drushi, who was Mudguliana, Considered thus, there are these two, or there are all these, virtuous bhikshus of good character, but I don't know their coming or going. Let me now take possession of the Brahmin householders, telling them, Come on now, abuse, rival, scold, and harass the virtuous bhikshus of good character. Then, perhaps, when they are abused, rivaled, scolded, and harassed by you, some change will come about in their minds, whereby the Maradrushi might find an opportunity to corrupt their minds and get them to stop getting out of samsara. <laughs> so then the evil one, so th wait, then evil one, the Maradusi, took possession of those Brahmin householders and told them, come on now, abuse, rival, scold, and harass the virtuous bhikshus of good character. Then perhaps when they are abused, rivaled, scolded, and harassed by you, some change will come about in their minds, whereby the Maradusi may find an opportunity. Then when the Maradusi had taken possession of the Brahmin householders, they went ahead and abused, rivaled, <laughs> reviled, scolded, and harassed the virtuous bhikkhus of good character thus, saying, These bald-padded recluses, these swarthy menial offspring of the kinsmen feet, they claim, we're meditators. <laughs> we're meditators. <laughs> And with shoulders drooping, heads down, all limp, they meditate, pre-meditate, out-meditate, they mis-meditate. Just like an owl on a branch waiting for a mouse meditates, pre-meditates, out-meditates, and mis-meditates. Or just, just as a jackal on a riverbank waiting for a fish meditates, pre-meditates, out meditates and mismeditates, or just like a cat waiting for a mouse by an alley or a drain or rubbish heaps, meditates, premeditates, out meditates, and mismeditates, or just like a donkey unladen standing by a doorpost or a dustbin or a drain, meditates, premeditates, out meditates, and mismeditates. So too. These bald-headed recluses, these swarthy menial offspring of the kinsmen feet, they claim we're meditators, we're meditators. And with shoulders drooping, heads down and all limp, they meditate, premeditate, out-meditate, and mismeditate. Now, evil one. On that occasion, most of those human beings that did that abuse when they died, they reappeared on the dissolution of the body after death in a state of deprivation, in an unhappy destination, in perdition, even in hell.
All right, how's everybody doing? Cool. Because we're still we're really just getting the backstory here. So then that blessed Buddha, Kakusandha, accomplished and fully enlightened, addressed the bhikkhus thus. Bhikkhus, the Mara Dusi has taken possession of the Brahmin householders, telling them, come on now, abuse, revile, scold and harass the virtuous bhikshus. Then perhaps when they are abused, some change will come about in their mind, whereby I might find an opportunity to corrupt them. Come, bhikkhus. And now this is the Buddha telling all of his bhikkhus who have been reviled by the Brahmin householders. They've been abused, scolded by the Brahmin householders. But the Buddha says, come, bhikkhus. Abide pervading one quarter with a mind imbued with loving kindness. Likewise, the second quarter, the third quarter, the fourth quarter, so above, so below, all around and everywhere and to all as yourselves. Abide pervading the all-encompassing world with a mind imbued with loving kindness, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility and without ill will. Abide pervading one quarter with a mind imbued with compassion. Likewise, the second, the third, and the fourth, so above and so below, all around and everywhere, and to all as yourself, abide pervading the all-encompassing world with a mind imbued with compassion, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility and without ill will. Abide pervading one quarter with a mind of empathic joy. Likewise, the second, the third, the fourth, above and below, and everywhere, all around, and to all as yourself. Abide pervading the all-encompassing world with a mind imbued with empathic joy, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility without ill will. Abide pervading one quarter with equanimity. Two, three, four, above and below, all around and everywhere, and to all as yourself. Abide pervading the all-encompassing world with a mind imbued with equanimity, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility and without ill will. So, evil one, when those bhikkhus had been thus advised and instructed by the blessed one, Kakusandha, accomplished and fully enlightened, then gone to the forest or to the root of a tree or to an empty hut, they abided, pervading one quarter with a mind imbued with loving kindness and with a mind imbued with compassion, with a mind imbued with empathic joy, and with a mind imbued with equanimity, without hostility, and without ill will. All right. So that was the, the Mara Dusi, who, let's remember, is Magulyana in a previous life. That was Mara Dusi's first attempt possessing the Brahmin householders and trying to get the householders to abuse and scold the monks. But then, evil one, the Mara Dusi considered thus, though I do as I'm doing, I still don't know the coming or the going of these virtuous bhikkhus of good character. Let me now take possession of the Brahmin householders again, telling them, 
Come on now. Honor, respect, revere, and venerate the virtuous bhikkhus of good character. Then perhaps, when they have been honored, respected, revered, and venerated by you, some change will come about in their minds, whereby the Maradusi might find an opportunity. Then, evil one, the Maradusi took possession of those Brahmin householders, telling them, come on now, honor, respect, revere, and venerate the virtuous bhikkhus. Then perhaps, when they've been honored, respected, revered, and venerated, some change will come about in their minds, whereby I might find an opportunity. And then when the Maradusi had taken possession of the Brahmin householders, they did honor, respect, revere, and venerate the vener virtuous bhikkhus. Now, evil one, on that occasion, most of those human beings that did the honoring and the revering of all the bhikkhus, when they died, reappeared on the dissolution of the body after death, they reappeared in a happy place, in a happy destination, even in a heavenly world. Then, evil one, the blessed one Kakusandha, accomplished and fully enlightened, addressed the bhikkhus thus. Bhikkhus, the Mara Dusi has taken possession of those Brahmin householders, telling them, come on, honor, respect, revere, and venerate the bhikkhus. Then perhaps when they are honored, respected, revered, and venerated, some change will come about in their minds, whereby I might find an opportunity. Come, bhikkhus. Now, this is the Buddha telling the bhikkhus, who have now just been honored, revered by all the Brahmin householders. The Buddha says, come, bhikkhus. Abide contemplating the foulness of the body, perceiving repulsiveness in nutriment, perceiving disenchantment with all the world, contemplating impermanence in all formations. So, evil one, when those bhikkhus had been thus advised and instructed by the Blessed One Kakusandha, accomplished and fully enlightened, then gone to the forest or to the root of a tree or to an empty hut, they abided contemplating the foulness of the body, perceiving repulsiveness in nutriment, perceiving disenchantment with the whole world, contemplating impermanence in all the formations. All right. So, just to make clear, Mara, the evil one, Dusi, has taken these two approaches. And just in case you didn't catch it, the idea here is, is that, you know, Dusi, Mara, is trying to get in the monks' heads in that way. And so the first way is through, again, scolding and being mean, trying to get a rise out of them. And the Buddha says, oh, well, practice the four immeasurable states of mind, right? The idea of loving kindness, compassion, empathic joy, and equanimity. That is the number one Buddhist way to counteract anger and ill will. Number one. That's the way. So then, Ducey tries it the other way, which is through honor. And again, if you didn't catch it, basically, Ducey was trying to get them to be arrogant, trying to get them to be full of ego, full of pride by being honored. And so the Buddha says, in order to counteract that possibility of ego and conceit, the Buddha recommends the meditation on the unloveliness of the body. Or the perceiving a, or having a repulsiveness towards nutriment or perceiving disenchantment with the whole world or contemplating impermanence of everything. So those are four sort of different meditations that would all approach this possibility of ego conceit in that way. So... That makes sense to everybody. Everybody doing okay with that? Cool. 
And by the way, that is also, if you didn't know this, if you, if you hadn't heard it, regarding the two poisons of attraction and aversion, the Buddha always gives the unloveliness of the body as a way of counteracting lust or attraction or desire. And he always gives the four immeasurables as a way of counteracting ill will, aversion, or anger. So this is just super classic in that way. But the plot thickens. So after all of that, then when it was morning, the Blessed One, the Buddha, Kakwasandha, accomplished and fully enlightened, dressed and taking his bowl and outer robe, he went into the village for alms with the venerable Vidura as his attendant. Then the Mara Dusi took possession of a certain boy, and picking up a stone, he struck the venerable Vidura on the head and with it and cut his head. With blood running from his cut head, the venerable Vidura followed close behind the blessed one Kakwasandha, accomplished and fully enlightened one. Then the blessed one Kakwasandha, accomplished and fully enlightened, turned around and looked at the boy with the elephant look. And he says, this Mara Drus Dusi knows no bounds. And with that look, evil one, the Mara Dusi fell from that place and reappeared in the great Avicii hell. So before we get into the hell realms, <laughs> So if you haven't heard of it before, of the elephant look. <laughs> so this is, you, you, you find this every now and then in the suttas. And what it is, is you hear about a Buddha. Here it's uh, Kakusandha. But you hear about the, a Buddha giving the elephant look. And what that means is, or it, it is defined as, turning around but if you can imagine turning entirely from your waist so that you are turned basically 180 degrees around but your feet are still facing forward so from your waist you with they say that without turning your neck you turn 180 degrees around that's the elephant look. They, they say that it's like a superpower of a Buddha to be able to do that. But what I really want us to notice is that the Buddha basically like, does he kill this little boy that threw the stone? He seems to be killing Mara or Dusi in that way. There's one interesting thing that I want to mention about this. So if if you read if you read all the footnotes about this one they will go to great lengths to make it clear that the buddha didn't kill anybody all right with with his laser stare right um you know the commentators don't want it to be the case that a buddha killed anybody and but i do want to draw everybody's attention to a very interesting uh there's a really interesting parallel. And what the interesting parallel is, and this may not be of interest to everybody, but as you may know, in the uh, Christian religious tradition, there are the four gospels of the New Testament, right? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But if you know anything about Christianity or the history of Christianity, you'll know that there's actually a lot more Gospels than just Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's just that the Catholic Church decided that the only four you should know about are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. 
but there's actually a lot of other gospels. And in addition to all of these other stories of the life of Jesus, there's also a little subcategory of gospel, which are called infancy gospels. And they are actually these stories of Jesus when he was a kid, when he was like a, either a baby or an adolescent. And there's a very famous gospel or uh, infancy gospel, and it's the infancy gospel of Thomas. I mention it because it's a very kind of controversial um, gospel because Jesus is around like 12 years old. And in that, he does, I believe, get hit with a stone. And he curses the little boy that threw it and the little boy withers and dies. <laughs> and this is sort of a, in at least in like the Catholic Christian tradition is a little problematic. And they kind of basically describe it, or at least the commentary tradition, they basically describe it as a young God who just needed to learn to control his superpowers in that way. Anyways, I just thought it was very interesting that there's these kind of interesting overlap in these sort of um, a, a form of an infancy gospel, if you will, or like a backstory. So. I'm not claiming there's any uh, contact between the two, but it is interesting, though. So. All right. So after this last attempt by uh, the Mara Dusi, right, taking possession of a little boy to throw a stone, right? Uh, you know, I love this line where... Uh, where the Buddha Kakusanda says, uh, this, this Mara Dusi knows no bounds. Yeah. And so with that look, the Mara Dusi falls to the lowest level of hell, the Avicii hell, also just known as the great hell. Now we need to remember that this is Magulyana, talking to our world's Mara. And Mugliana tells Mara, for many a year, or sorry, sorry. He says, now, evil one, there are three names for the great hell. The hell of the six bases for contact the hell of the implement with stakes and the hell to be felt for oneself. Then, evil one, the wardens of hell came up to me and they said, because remember, he's Mara the Dusi. So they came up to me and they said, good sir, when stake meets stake in your heart, then you will know I have been roasting in hell for a thousand years. For many a year, evil one, for many a century, for many a millennia, I roasted in the great hell. For 10 millennia, I roasted in the auxiliary great hell, which is even worse, apparently, experiencing the feeling called that of emergence from ripening. My body had the same form as a human body, but my head had the form of a fish's head. All right, and then we have this concluding poem. And before we get to the concluding poem, let's actually kind of discuss the, the sutta a little bit. So, as I said in the beginning, I haven't fully figured out what this sutta is about. And what I mean by that is, is that, you know, it's, I would say, you know, the focus kind of seems to be the idea of Mara giving monks 
or just practitioners, Mara giving practitioners trouble. That's what the sutta is about. It begins with Mara giving Mugulyana a belly ache in that way and giving him trouble. But then we get a backstory about when Mugulyana was a Mara giving Bhikkhu's trouble, right? So one thing, that's the one thing that it's about. And I think that what we can do is we can take away from this, if we kind of go back to my opening remarks, where I was talking about a little Mara on one shoulder and a little Buddha on the other shoulder. Well, the idea is, is that the little Mara on one shoulder might show up as, you know, anger in that way. And it might, that little Mara might show up as somebody else being angry towards you. It might show up as you being angry towards yourself in that way. But the idea is, is that if Mara shows up in your life and is doling out the anger and is provoking and goading you with anger, and again, it, it could be coming from the outside, it could be coming from the inside. This sutta is here to say, as a remedy for that, what you can do is you can cultivate the four immeasurable states of mind. Again, they're also called the Brahma Viharas, right? These, um, the idea of loving kindness, compassion, empathic joy, and equanimity. And that's the counter to experiencing anger. But again, Mara might also try to mess with you in terms of desire or in terms of ego, pride, or conceit in that way. And the sutta is here to tell us that as a countermeasure to that, buttas all the way back to Kakusanta have been suggesting one of these four meditations. Foulness of the body, not being in the nutriment, disenchantment with the whole world, or contemplating the impermanence in all formations, it's called. Actually, because we didn't dwell on those four, any questions about those four meditations? I would want to remind you that they are definitely meditations indicative of the Hinayana, meditations indicative of like earlier Buddhism in that way. Um, you know, when they're talking about the meditations on the foulness of the body, that is usually referring to what are called the charnel ground meditations, meditating on corpses, but it's also sort of about meditating on, you know, just the, the body being full of piss and pus and just kind of nasty stuff that you wouldn't actually really want to be associated with. And then that's a way of counteracting attraction or over-attraction in that way. Um, we've done a whole, we did a couple of nights a long time ago on the Buddhist idea of nutriment. There's four nutriments. Food is only one of them. And then there's like contact, sensations, and consciousness, sort of being engaged in stimuli is nutriment. And so this meditation is about perceiving repulsiveness in nutriment. And that is definitely a part of the early Buddhist tradition that I have found explicit references in Mahayana Buddhism against. And basically it's the, um, in the early Buddhist tradition, they kind of really wanted you to develop a very bad attitude towards the world sexuality, and food. It's a kind of a, a, a part of early Buddhism that Mahayana Buddhism dismisses with. In particular, the idea of, of um, growing, di like, like becoming disinterested in food to ultimately to the point where you fast a lot of the time. That's a very kind of early Buddhist, very kind of more austere, ascetic type of Buddhism that practices that. And again, you don't see it 
in the Mahayana tradition, and sometimes you actually see it explicitly spoken against in that way. Um, the language that you will find in the Mahayana tradition, it's about bodhisattvas not disparaging their body. You, you, it's a it's a line that you hear a lot in Mahayana sutras that bodhisattvas do not disparage their body. And that seems to be a direct reference to the Hinayana tradition that wants you to disparage the body in, in a way. So just wanted to point that out. All right, any questions, comments, ideas before we get to the last little poem? Cool. So, this is again, it's still Magulyana talking to Mara. <clears throat> and now he concludes with a little poem. What can hell be well compared to, wherein Dusi roasted, assailant of Vidura the disciple? And the Brahmin Kakusandha, stakes of steel, even a hundred, each, each one suffered separately. These can hell be well compared to, wherein Dusi roasted, assailant of Vidura the disciple, and the Brahmin Kakusandha. Dark one, you have much to suffer by assaulting such a bhikkhu an enlightened one's disciple, who directly knows this fact. In the middle of the ocean, there are mansions lasting kalpas, sapphire shining, fiery gleaming, with a clear translucent luster, where iridescent sea nymphs dance in complex, intricate rhythms. Dark one, you have much to suffer, who directly knows this first, or who directly knows this fact. I am one who, when exhorted by the enlightened one in person, shook Megara's mother's palace with his toe, the whole order watching. Dark one, you have much to suffer, who directly knows this fact. And that's, of course, a paraphrase of a line that's being repeated. I am one who, wielding firmly strength of supernormal powers, shook all Vijayanta palace with his toe to incite the gods. Dark one, you have much to suffer, I who directly know this fact. I am one who in that palace posed to Chakra this question. Do you know then, friend, deliverance in cravings utter destruction? Whereupon Chakra then answered, truly to the question asked to him, Dark one, you have much to suffer, who directly knows this fact? I am one who thought of posing Brahma this question in the Sudharma Hall in heaven. Is there still found in you, friend, the wrong view you once accepted? Do you see the radiance surpassing that in the Brahma world? Brahma then answered my question truthfully and in due sequence. There is found in me no longer, sir, the wrong view that once I held. Indeed, I see the radiance surpassing that of the Brahma world. Today, how could I maintain that I am permanent and eternal? Dark one, you have much to suffer. Who directly knows this fact? I am one who with liberation has touched the peak of Mount Sumeru, visited the Pubavidena's grove and whatever humans dwell on earth. Dark one, you have much to suffer by assaulting such a bhikkhu, an enlightened one's disciple who directly knows this fact. There has never been found a fire which intends, let me burn this fool, but a fool who assaults a fire burns himself by his own doing. So it is with you, O Mara, by assaulting the Tathagata like a fool who plays with fire, you only burn yourself alone. By assaulting the Tathagata, you generate much demerit. 
Evil one, do you imagine that your evil will not ripen? Doing this, you store up evil, which will last long, O oh end maker. Mara, shun the enlightened one. Play no more your play no more your tricks on the bhikkhus. And so the bhikkhu chastened Mara in the Besakala thicket, whereupon the somber spirit disappeared right then and there. All right. So this poem is interesting because it's actually full of references to other suttas that we've read. We haven't read all of the references, but we've read a few of them. Oh, and I've definitely mentioned a few of them. So, um, yeah, I, I kind of, let me just kind of mention these because I want to talk about a, a larger idea. So the first one that gets mentioned is in uh, verse 26, where he says, I'm the one who, when exhorted uh, by the Buddha, shook Migara mother's palace with his toe, the whole order watching. So that particular sutta or that particular story occurs in the Samyutta Nikaya, the connected discourses of the Buddha that we did kind of a while ago. And basically the backstory on that, which is interesting, there were all of these lazy monks living in the brick house, which is Migara mother's place. And the Buddha knew that all the monks were kind of being lazy. And so the Buddha told Magulyana, he says, go stir up a sense of urgency in those monks. And so Magulyana just places his big toe on the ground and the brick house starts shaking and all of the monks come running out only to realize that it was Magulyana who had shook the entire brick house just by touching his big toe to the ground. And the idea is, is that that was a, a display of supernatural power, right? We hear about these all the time. We hear about these in the Buddhist tradition, these various siddhis or supernatural powers. This guy, Maha Mogulyana, is considered to have like the most advanced supernatural powers. But what we want to notice from, from the story is it's about exercising these supernatural powers so that basically so that the monks come out and they want to be just like Magulyayana. <laughs> They're like, wow, you're so powerful. How can we be like you? And, and basically, Madhulayana is saying, stop being lazy and you can be just like me. So that's what's being referenced there in that one. Um, a similar thing happens in uh, the a sutta that we also didn't really read, uh, where Madhulayana goes up to heaven and shakes the palace of the gods similarly uh, instilling in them a sense of urgency. And then the last one is actually kind of reminiscent of the sutta that we read last week, even though this is referencing another sutta from the Samyutta Nikaya. But this is the one where Magulyayana basically goes up and has a question and answer with Brahma because Brahma thinks he's eternal. And Magulyayana convinces him otherwise in that way. And so all three of those, all three of those are these kind of instances of Magulyayana displaying supernatural power and ultimately basically saying, I'm more powerful than you, Mara. 
Like, don't even think about messing with the one who shook the brick house. Don't even think about messing with the one who shook the palace of the gods in that way. But then let's discuss this beautiful line. And, and in many ways, now that we've talked about it now for this evening, and I do think that that last little part really is the, the essence of the sutta there. And it's that beautiful line where it's, you know, there's never been a fire that said, let me get this fool. <laughs> Just very, very funny, right? <laughs> but a fool who assaults a fire burns himself by his own doing. And that's the idea of, of you really don't want to mess with a monk or a nun. You really don't want to mess with a virtuous person. It's you're playing with fire is, is kind of what they're just talking about in that way. So I would definitely say that that's sort of the, um, again, the gist of it is about Mara provoking meditators or practitioners. And like, what does that mean for Mara to provoke a practitioner? Then we're looking at these countermeasures, as they might be called, the four immeasurable states of mind or meditation on impermanence, right? So that's sort of the idea. But I think there's something kind of deeper going on here than just the Buddha giving countermeasures to anger or greed in that way. My feeling is, is that this sutta is... It's sort of a uh, an encouragement. I, I think that that end is the whole sutta in a way is an encouragement to you, the practitioner in that way. And basically kind of saying, don't you want to be like Mogulyana? Don't you want to be that powerful? Don't you want to be able to rebuke Mara? Because that's what the sutta is about, is about Mugliana saying, yo, get out. I see you, get out. Like, you can't mess with me. And so I think that this sutta is about aspiring to be somebody that Mara can't mess with. And if you don't quite know how to become such a person, there's a few countermeasures in order to help you on your way. The only last piece of the puzzle is that very last stanza. So the bhikkhu, who is Magulyana, chastened Mara, rebuked Mara in the thicket, whereupon the somber spirit disappeared right then and there. So was Magulyana's belly ache about being sad? I, I, I don't know, but I'm, I'm curious about that last line where the somber spirit disappeared. That would kind of make it seem like the somber spirit was there and that that's what Magliana was sort of suffering from. Speculation, I don't know, but would love to hear your thoughts or ideas or questions or comments about any of this. There's a lot of different topics in here. Yeah, Noe. Oh, thank you so much. I really like this uh, because it also points that, that Mara who, who so easily entered other people <laughs> to attack the bhikkhus. Therefore, I, we defend ourselves because when does my thinking my thinking turned. When does my idea is like, oh, you know, you could get away with that. You know, ah, uh, you know, a couple more hours of Netflix. I don't know, you know, mm -hmm. or <laughs> yeah. So it really is an allegory of that, you know, and and uh, uh, it, uh, it it's 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 lovely. To, so it is a, a teaching uh, for me. It's a teaching of of it's here, of course. Mahayana, I'm a Mahayana practitioner, so it's here. Here's where I. Here's where 
Oh, the somber thought. I, I like what you said. The somber spirit disappeared. Excellent. Uh, it is putting it here, wherever that is, which I don't know. Thank you. <laughs> Good talk. <clears throat> Thank you. I'm just going to read a comment real quick. Ah, I didn't mention that. So uh, somebody uh, mentioned about Mogollana being a Mara. And I totally forgot to, to explain that. So the interesting thing about like Buddhist cosmology is that, you know, there's these realms that we've talked about, the realm of desire, the realm of form and the formless realm. And within those realms, there are these uh, fixed figures. For example, in the realm of desire, at the very apex of the realm of desire is the god Chakra, also called Indra. At the top of the realm of form, there is the god Brahma. Now, within the realm of desire, there is also this Mara character, who again is like kind of like the evil one in that way. And the interesting thing about the Buddhist cosmology is that in the exact same way that there is always a giant Mount Sumeru in the middle of the world, and it's surrounded by four continents, and this is always true. Whenever a world is created, there's a giant mountain in the middle surrounded by four continents. It's always that way. Similarly, there is always a Chakra Indra, there's always a Mara, there's always a Brahma, there's always these people. But these are, these are positions that are filled by different people that are going through their reincarnations. And so the point is, is that there is always a Mara and in this particular temporal time dimension, the being that would become Magulyana had assumed the position of Mara in that realm. Now, when I first read this, and I totally forgot to mention this at the beginning, when I first read this, I couldn't help but wonder if they were kind of describing or kind of trying to say that Mugliana used to be uh, <laughs> not such a virtuous guy like before he was a monk I it, maybe that might be what the story is saying I, I'm not sure but in, in answer to the question that was in the comment that's the idea is that uh, basically the idea is that you too could be Mara but Normally, people are accruing and amassing punya or, or merit, not in the Buddhist tradition, but in kind of Indian culture that surrounds Buddhism. Most people are trying to get merit so that they can transfer that merit in order to become Chakra Indra, the king of the realm of desire. That's literally king of the mountain. And, and I, I use that expression literally because we're talking about Mount Sumeru, that giant mountain that's in the middle. Indra is king of the mountain. And so most people are trying to transfer their merit towards becoming a chakra, but it could happen that you become a Mara. It could become that you become a Brahma. A bunch of different things, so. I did want to point that out. Um, any other questions, comments, answers, or ideas? Ah, Maria. One more. Oh, sorry. Noe, oh. then Maria. Oh, oh just yes. I, I'm remembering the, 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 the nuns in the forest that Mar when Mara came, the sutra about the nuns coming to, and, and he's being his trickster and, yep. and the way they see him and move him along his way just 
recall that. Excellent, Dharma doors. Recall, Maria. So, comment then a quick question of clarification. But a uh, comment is, I'm so grateful that there are other practices and other ways of working with things like desire um, in other baskets and other places within Buddhist practice. Um, because I've never been able to get really any traction out of the ones being offered here, mostly because, you know, like when it comes to like the body or being gross or <laughs> things like that, so is my, so is this body, you know? So that doesn't, that, you know, like, it's like my faults are the same. <laughs> sure. So um, yep. anyways, um, and then isn't Magulayana the the one? Maybe I'm getting the name wrong. The the one who was uh, the great murderer. He was like he had the 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 necklace of of bones or of teeth or something. Um, mm -hmm. And then he kept trying to catch up with the Buddha. Yeah, yeah. Um, and um, I thought that was Magulayana. I um, I know what you're saying. I know the story you're saying, and I yeah I too can't remember who that was. Maybe I will do a little research and look into that. I think that maybe that was his path, his stuff that he did. That, that was, would that would make sense yeah. with this story for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. By the way, I did want to mention something. Oh, let me mention something real quick, Noam, and then. But I just wanted to reiterate an idea. And what it is, is, is that, you know, I, I would, I, I would not be the first person to say this at all. This is a very, um, you know, uh, this is an idea that's spoken about a lot and what it is, it's, it's the understanding that what we modern 20th, 21st century people, what we call mental illness other people might have called being possessed by the devil or being possessed by Mara or being possessed by evil spirits. Again, this is not my idea. This is a very like well spoken about, well written about idea that what we modern people call mental illness, other generations, that's what they called it was spirit possession, but it's the same thing in that way. I very much, it's, I'm kind of just reiterating what I said at the beginning, which is that I very much read a sutta like this as allegorical and very much about what we would call, you know, may, if it's about melancholy, if it's about depression, maybe, you know, those, that's our language in that way. And so I would just kind of want us to be aware that Buddhists, as far as I know, do not think that there's like spirits exactly like that. So, no, did you have something to add? Um, yeah, thank you. That was a pretty weird sutra, I have to say, but I yeah. enjoyed it. Good. Um, you make things that wouldn't on my own make much sense, make a lot of sense. So thank you. Um, but uh, yeah, on the allegorical level and, and the sort of like, what do I get out of this level? Uh, I, something that yeah, her, I feel yeah. like I hear all the time with Mara is it happened in this sutra and it happened, you know, we read all those sutras with the women, the bhikkhunis in Mara. Mm -hmm. and, and, and and they're always saying, I see you, Mara, right? That's like the phrase. Mm -hmm. It just seems like it it goes very nicely with the idea that so much of uh the of of the Buddhist path is like just noticing, like um, you know, it combines with all this other wisdom, right? But Oh yeah, I today I feel like you know life is hopeless. 
oh yeah, I see you, Mara. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. it's not like it's someone else doing it, but it's it's a part of you, and and that combined with you know this too shall pass the 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 in in um, impermanence of everything is is kind of a a way of looking at it. Yeah, that my comment. Lovely comment. Absolutely. Yeah. I think uh, that's the point. <laughs> yeah, stating the obvious. <laughs> yeah, but also you, you've, everybody here has heard me say it a million times, but I, you know, I'm always saying that like, on the one hand, it's so simple, like Buddhism, it's so simple because the practice is about stopping and noticing because the opposite of that is just getting angry and getting angrier. Now, we could get really uh, like dry and analytical and talk about, um, you know, talk about the mind in a very analytical way and in terms of like, Oh, you know, Buddhism and all these really technical ideas about samya and perception and samskara and all the, so we could get analytical in terms of what it means to stop and notice the arising of various dharmas. So we could do it dry and analytical, or you could get into this language of, I see you, Mara. I've been possessed by Mara. Mara kept me up all night, right? And all of a sudden you could be playing the kind of the, this poetic game that Buddhism plays where there's a whole other language using allegory and Mara and Brahma and Chakra. Or you could do it again, dry analytical language. But I just want you all to know that they're saying the same thing. It's just sort of upaya, so. Nice. Awesome. Mm. Thank you. All right, everybody, if that's it, we're going to call it a night. <laughs>